professor invited me to speak in a seminary in Indiana, and uh, uh, Professor Muller took me to lunch. Actually, we ate sushi, but uh, that was not the point. And uh, we talked a lot. He uh, uh, soaked on my, in my story and in order to introduce me. And, but when he got uh, to present to the students, he forgot my last name, but he remembered I am, that I am from Lebanon, the Middle East. So he said, please welcome Mr. Hisham Shishkabab. <laughs> the best joke ever on my name, you know. So uh, today with me I have Sam Thomas, who goes to North India but doesn't swing from his vine. It's all jungle, sir. No roads even. I met. Uh, why I'm mentioning Sam because uh, it shows how we need to join hands for the mission, God's mission. Because uh, I was uh, I I am I was a swimmer before COVID, and I used to go five in the morning to the YMCA in Schaumburg, you know. And uh, so I came out of the pool, and somebody was on the other side of the locker, and I had an, a Hindu. I was trying to lure him into coming to church, talking to him, and. Uh, a, an Indian guy came from behind the locker and he said, Are you Christian? I said, Yeah, I mean, even I'm a pastor. He said, Give me your number. So he found a toilet paper and I <laughs> my number on it. And uh, then at night, I usually I shut down my phone out of the blue. Hello, is this Hisham? I said, Yeah. He said, Well, uh, he asked me, are you, this is a far shot, you know, because there are many Sams, his name is Sam, Hisham, a regular common name in Arabic. Are you the guy mentioned by Irwin Lutzer in his book? I said, yes. Wow. He said, I had this book on my desk for uh, two yeah, weeks I and I did, the book from the borrowed it from Schamburg Library and decided that night to read it, you know. So he said, can I invite you to lunch? I said, sure. So he took me to Hibachi, which my first time to Hibachi. I like uh, the grilled, uh, you know, shrimp and fish, you know. So and uh, since then we came, uh, became, uh, you know, uh, uh, friends. And uh, he he asked me to take him with uh, with me to the mission uh, fest. I do I do mission fest coast to coast, so that people may know about him and support him and. Since then, it's been, you know, a blessing. With me also, I have uh, Rahim from Iraq. He was baptized at the age of 66. He is a Shiite from uh, South Iraq, and uh, he has 16 grandkids, okay? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so he's uh, my enemy friend, kind of. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, uh, d does anybody know who is in the picture? I mean, the, the, the European guy, not uh, Yasser Arafat. Who is in that no, uh, the guy, slide? Yeah. The other guy. Uh, I, oh, yeah. He, oh, yeah. Who? He passed away, right? Who? Yeah. Uh, Brother Andrew. Brother okay. Andrew. Brother Andrew. I was, uh, Brother Sorry. Andrew came to Lebanon in 2002 and asked me to translate for him. So Brother Andrew is a big wig usually. Wherever he goes, they uh, open doors for him because he was, God's smuggler means he used to smuggle Bibles into Soviet Union. So millions of Bibles. He would fill his uh, trunk and go. And, uh, and he taught me something very important. He said, the safest place in the world is in God's will. You know, yeah. and uh, uh, I he said after the collapse of the, the communism, he believed that Islam is the biggest challenge to the West because Islam is an organized uh, initiative against the gospel in any way or another. Uh, they they uh, they have a structured religion and they have an ideology and they have a political system. And they are very, uh, they proselytize, you know, they are very generous and they are very aggressive about it, you know, and they believe that they own the truth with a capital T. So I took him to the, one of the founders of Hezbollah, the terrorist organization uh, supported by Iran, and we gave him an Arabic Bible, talked to him, and Brother Andrew forgot his necktie in my van and I kept it as a souvenir. And, uh, so, 
Brother Andrew wrote this book and he said that Islam builds a brick wall around the heart of the Muslim because Muslims think that Jesus is an idol, an idol, you know. So when I was a Muslim, I, when I used to hear the word Jesus in Arabic, which is Christian Arabic, different from Islamic Arabic, I used to feel a dagger stabbing, me, you know, like, you know, Yeshua. It's an Arabic Yeshua, like Yeshua in Hebrew. A dagger stabbing me, like as we, the son of God means uh, polytheism for Muslims, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so Islam builds a brick wall around the heart of the Muslim. And uh, mm -hmm. I used to study medicine, pre-medical studies. I was going to be a doctor, but I, so I, I used to say uh, Islam builds antibodies in the heart of the Muslim against Jesus. Really, you know? And uh, but with the Holy Spirit. That who removes the first brick, Jesus enters the hearts of many people, many Muslims. Just last week, a, an Egyptian, 75 years old, as, uh, he had been seeing Jesus in visions and dreams for three years, and one of his uh, neighbors contacted me, and he said he wants to know what's going on. And uh, I asked him, so I met with him uh, after they gave him my number, what have you. We had coffee, and I asked him, so... So what did you see? He said, well, Jesus was standing at a gate or a door and I was on the other side. I told him, this is Revelation 3.20. He is knocking at the door of your heart, open for him, you know. So now he's coming to the fellowship, to the Bible study, to the retreat on Saturday he came. So uh, it was not my plan to become a pastor or a missionary. It was God's plan. And you know, through this story, it's God's story, not my story. And, uh, and, uh, uh, I lead uh, two uh, mission societies, Salam Christian Fellowship, which is in Chicagoland, and Messiah for Muslims, which coast to coast, we help people go to seminary and start missions. Uh, and uh, what do I have here? Yeah, yeah. Going backwards. Yeah, yeah, backwards. Yeah. yeah. So I was born in Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon is the Middle East, south of Turkey, not south of Texas. There are many Lebanons, one in Indiana, one in Texas, etc. But this is Lebanon, the Middle East. Lebanon was mentioned in the Bible. The Lebanon mentioned the Bible is Mount Lebanon, okay? Not really uh, the country, the political country we know today. And it's Mount Lebanon that was mentioned in the Bible. This is why in the German they say Der Lebanon, the Lebanon means a mount, mountain, which is a green strip you see to the west here, near the Mediterranean. And uh, Lebanon is famous for the cedars, uh, they grow in width more than height, and uh, the Lebanese are very proud of them. They live thousands of years. One of them is 3,000 years old. And they sell them to pharaohs, and uh, King Solomon built uh, part of his temple out of cedar wood. So the Lebanese are very proud of the cedar tree, and nothing could unite, unite, unite them, even the cedar. But they decided to put the cedar tree on the flag, you know. So I was in Canada, no offense to Canadians, speaking at the near Niagara Falls, and uh, I saw the Canadian flag with, with the maple leaf. I told them, oh, you have one leaf on your flag. We have the, we have the whole tree in Lebanon, you know? <laughs> it, it wasn't a popular joke in Canada. <laughs> yeah. So the, the history of Lebanon as a political uh, entity starts in, after World War I. Uh, you can ask me more about this, but briefly, uh, Lebanon had 50% Christian population, and uh, in the 19th, end of the 19th century, uh, something like 25,000 Christians were massacred by, uh, by uh, the Turks and the uh, Kurds and uh, Muslims from Beirut to Damascus, actually. So when uh, World War II, World War I took place and the Allies won, they asked the Allies for a country for Christians in Lebanon, to, uh, like a haven for all Christians, like uh, Jews in Israel, you know, Christians in Lebanon. So uh, they uh, rejected their uh, pleas, uh, but, uh, but uh, petition, but they uh, Ac later accepted a compromise because also Muslims sent uh, a delegation to Versailles where, the, uh, where they met uh, and uh, where the allied forces met and decided to divide uh, 
the Middle East into spheres of power between the French and the uh, British. They call it Sykes-Picot Agreement. Uh, no time to go further. If you want to ask me, I can answer questions. And one of the, of the important things they did, I believe until today, even it's really not perfect, they installed a Christian president, uh, and it's now by mandate and constitution that every you cannot become president, commander, and chief unless you are Maronite with, a, with an arm, not Mennonite. Maronite means Catholic, Lebanese, Christian. You see, so this is the only country in the Middle East which has a Christian president until today, you know. So uh, uh, they, uh, one of the other things important in the history of the area is uh, formation of, of the, mandate, the mandate on Palestine where uh, the British gave uh, permission to the Jews to, uh, to immigrate to the Promised Land from all over the world. And this started problems between the Jews and the, and the Muslims and the Arabs mainly. And, uh, uh, after World War II, the UN took over because there were a lot of riots and civil unrest and they declared a Palestinian uh, government and a Israel, Israel as a Jewish state and they declared Jerusalem a free zone. But the Arabs rejected the UN resolution and formed five armies that attacked Israel uh, and uh, to their awe and humiliation they were defeated by half a million Jews and uh, more uh, refugees came out of uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, and settled in, in Lebanon. So Lebanon, that was uh, a problem, like what I mean by that, a compromise between Christians and Muslims, uh, received half a million, Lebanon was less than two million people, received half a million Palestinian Muslim refugees who, who were called the Army of Islam. And this really led to, uh, uh, the, a, a big problem between the Christians and the Muslims because Muslims supported the Palestinians and the Christians thought they are a threat to their power. And in 1958, we had this first civil war between Christians and Muslims, uh, 1958. I was minus two years old then, so I wasn't <laughs> part of it, you know. And uh, the U.S. Marines came into Beirut and settled the fight and installed again a good president who uh, who rebuilt the country. Uh, I was uh, born in 1960 in a peaceful period, but not not that peaceful. I was playing marbles in the field. You know what are marbles? You know you're my generation kind of. And I looked up uh, William, a Syrian Christian, was standing above me with a with a. Uh, stick, a piece of wood, and that piece of wood was a nail, and he banged me on the head. He got me here, one inch away from my eye. So that was my first encounter with a Christian boy at the age of seven, you know. <laughs> so uh, my parents sent me to a Islamic school. The Shahabs are, when I left, were 5,000 people in Beirut. So there's a Shahab mosque, Shahab school, Shahab baker, what have you. So we claim that we descend from the uh, tribe of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, and a cousin of my dad uh, donated the land, so they called the mosque and the school after him. So I went to Shahab school, but uh, with all mess around me, the Palestinian-Israeli struggle, the uh, uh, tug of war between Christians and Muslims uh, in Lebanon, I was lost, I didn't have, uh, you know, any answers, and uh, one day I was at the mosque, Shahab Mosque, when a uh, member of the Muslim Brotherhood approached me and my only sibling, my only brother, uh, and he, he gave us books written by the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, we were taught that the world is divided into two parts, the world of Islam and the world of infidels, and the duty of Muslims to convert the other part of the world by persuasion, if not subjugate them by force, because non-Muslims are not uh, uh, fit to lead the, uh, yeah, they corrupt the air, they are, as a verse in the Quran that says, infidels are worse than animals, you know? And so Muslims are the chosen who could lead humanity to joy, peace, and fulfillment, you know? So, and he said that the Arab leaders are just uh, as bad as infidels because they are importing uh, either Western solutions or Eastern solutions and from the Soviet Union. 
and we need to follow Islam, which is uh, in Islam we have the answer for all the maladies of the society, and that we'll we'll conquer again and form a uh, establish a global Muslim state like the Muslims used to have in the Middle Ages, and that we are living in shame because we are under a Christian president, and we have to. Uh, either convert them or subjugate them. And Islam is a religion of shame. And let, uh, I mean, we can talk more about this, but uh, this is why, in, in, whether in the West or, or the Middle East or North Africa or wherever, where there are Muslim communities, there is something called anar killing. If they discover that the girl is dating, they may beat her up or put her under house arrest or sometimes kill her, you know? So we were taught Islam is the solution for everything and we have just to follow the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, and that one day we'll conquer because Allah will bless us. Uh, and that Christians are just crusaders, we need to really to uh, uh, deal with them, you know. And uh, the Christians were threatened, they felt that they were going to lose power, they formed militias, and they were very right-wing, and they started uh, setting up... Uh, checkpoints and checking the uh, IDs of people, sometimes killing Muslims, etc. So uh, at the age of 13, I, uh, I was invited to a military training camp with my brother, my only sibling. We were taught how to shoot rifles, how to shoot rocket propelled grenades, how to shoot uh, later mortars. It was fun, like if you watch Clint Eastwood, you know, for a few dollars more and Charles Brunson, you identify with you know, the gun, the violence, you know. And uh, the Christian militias were armed to the teeth, and uh, they imported uh, Western weapons, as you see in M16 here, and uh, their clergy, uh, you know, blessed their arms and tanks, and they were more, but they were still a minority because uh, after they were 50% of the country, they wanted to be like the French. They got one kid and a dog, while the Muslims got ten kids, you know, and with time they, the Muslims outnumbered them. They asked, asked for political power, which they're right, you know. So, at the, in 1975, a leader of the Christian militia came out of church and somebody tried to assassinate him. They thought the Palestinians did that. So they, uh, the Christian militias ambushed a bus driving Palestinians and Muslims riddled it with bullet, and uh, an all-out civil war broke out. At the age of 15, I found myself in the street with a rifle going to a high-rise building, building try, trying to, uh, to kind of uh, uh, snipe at Christian neighborhoods. But there is an, an incident that really could be used as a window on the world view of Muslims and how they believe they should live their lives. Like... Uh, uh, my brother and I, he uh, was older than me, so he, he drived illegally, no problem, I mean, civil war, you know. So we got on the Land Rover and we drove to the green uh, zone, where green line, where it's the other side is Christian, uh, and the, the, our side is Muslim. So he tried to, uh, to uh, wanted to try this small mortar cannon for the first time, very small really, and I didn't like it. I told him this, this mortar cannon could, uh, uh, the shells could fall on the head of civilians and innocent people. I don't, let's pull all out. So we pulled out and uh, I convinced him. We went to the head of the Muslim Brotherhood in Beirut and I asked him the same question. I signed up for a jihad to defend the Muslim community against the crusaders. Now I see myself shelling civilians. What's the deal? He asked me a question that, which is a key to understanding Islam. Who is your example in life as a Muslim? I said, Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam. He said, excellent, this is the best answer. Because Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, shelled his enemies with catapults. And catapults are blind medieval machines, while mortar cannons are blind modern machines. And we are basically, by analogy, doing the same thing. We need to really to weaken the enemy, you know? So. Uh, so this is why it's kind of uh, studying the life of Muhammad, his uh, invasions to, to the countries around Arabia and uh, in Arabia as well, would, we would understand more how Muslims see the world, you know. And, uh, and the, uh, the leader who passed away recently, like a few years ago, asked me, uh, 
Uh, I heard you recite the Quran. Uh, you are very good and you are from a good family. We want new blood and I see in you maybe a future leader. Would you like to start preaching Friday? I was almost 16, so uh, he, I said, thank you, this is an honor, you know. I mean, imagine you preaching from a pulpit, you know, and uh, they, they do it on Friday. So uh, uh, he said, we'll assign you a mentor. He was a Muslim Brotherhood member from Syria living in exile in Beirut, and, uh, and in six months they were able to microwave me into a preacher. I was give, ready to give my first Friday message. But God had a different plan for my life. I got into a head-on collision. If you remember, those was Thalia Volkswagen vans. They don't have an engine. So I broke both legs. And instead of preaching Friday, I was bedridden for a year, 50 days at the American University Hospital, three bones broken in the right leg, one, one bone uh, and small, really, bones in the ankle. And... Uh, uh, I saw how uh, doctors and nurses were speaking in English. The American University of Beirut is the Harvard of the Middle East, you know. And they are dealing with my broken bones and, uh, and wounds. And uh, I thought, why a preacher? Maybe I could become a medical doc doctor, you know. When you see how uh, doctors walk the hallways like half guys and people look up at them and, you know, at least you make more money, right? You know, so, Amen, so, brother. Yeah. <laughs> I decided I want to study medicine, you know. I want to put a plan to study medicine. So I decided to teach myself English, more English. I knew the grammar, the basics. So to spend the time, I had all the time on my hands, bedridden for a year. I started, started reading comic books, you know, easy, <laughs> the dictionary. And I ran them out of the market, and uh, I discovered a Western novelist called Louis Lamour. I read all his novels and short story collections. In 1979, I sat for an English exam at the American University of Beirut. I passed with flying colors, also scientific quantitative tests. I was admitted as a pre-medical student, and I thought I'd forget about the Civil War and uh, just focus on my studies, and my brother said, don't worry, we'll provide the tuition fees for you. He was a breadwinner, you know, because my, my uh, uh, father was just a simple civil servant. And uh, at the American University of Beirut, you know, the language instruction is English, right? And, uh, but uh, the first semester, my only brother, my only sibling, uh, was killed by a Christian militia. I was devastated. I couldn't really hold my, the course load. I dropped mo some of the courses and decided to kill my enemies. I thought revenge is sweet. I should get, I got a silencer and a gun and decided that if I can make kind of uh, uh, friends with some of my classmates uh, who belong to that militia, I, I would know where they live, how they move at night in, over, in order to ambush them easier. But again, God had a different plan for my life. And uh, one day I came back from a night of stalking my enemies to hear something that would change my whole life. I signed up for a course of cultural studies. And that course of cultural studies included uh, selections from uh, Babylonian mythology, from Mesopotamia, uh, Greek mythology, selections from the Old Testament, selections from the New Testament, selections from the Quran, the Book of Islam, selections from uh, Western philosophy up to Nietzsche, from Socrates to Nietzsche. And uh, that uh, time coming into the classroom, the professor was quoting the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies. I thought, wow, this is ridiculous. You know, who could love them? <laughs> uh, pray for those who persecute you. I thought, wow. Turn the other cheek. How could somebody like me, you know, theoretically, you know, do it? It's impossible, you know. In the Quran, we have mo more miracles for Jesus. But he is not the son of God, and uh, he is only merely a prophet. And, but his teachings are not there. There is nothing about his teachings. So uh, I used to pray five times a day. I devout Muslim, some of them, most of them in the mosque. So I used to walk at dawn going to the mosque, even it was dangerous. 
And I used to pray, God, show me the truth. This is ridiculous. Who could love his enemies, you know? Who could say something like that? This is superhuman, you know? And uh, the next day, the professor came up with uh, the incident when Jesus was questioned by the Pharisees to trick him. And uh, uh, what about the greatest command? He said, love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength, you know? So... I thought Muslims are trying to do that because they pray five times a day, not only come to church on Sunday, you know. They pray from dawn to evening, five prayers, and they are ready to die for Allah, you know, and a jihad. But this Jesus Christ is overdoing it. How could somebody love God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength, etc.? I should really look into this Jesus. I should get a Bible and start reading, and I did. And I started, you know, I thought I'd put the intellectual hat and the spiritual hat so I would sneak into churches, hear how they speak about Jesus, and read books that criticize the Bible, the Quran. And uh, I found a, uh, a German scholar who criticized the Quran and said part of the Quran was written in Aramaic and it's really copy paste from the Talmud and the Mishnah, whatever. I was shocked because. Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of Allah, letter and meaning, and it's eternal. It existed with Allah since eternity. And this man is a German scholar is telling me who wrote in the 19th century that he is uh, the Quran is a historical compilation. You know, so uh, then I uh, I couldn't focus on uh, medicine, pre medicine. I quit and changed my major. Long story short, I was preparing for my master's degree in the history of Islam when my professor gave me a book written by a Canadian scholar called uh, uh, Wilfred Cantwell Smith. Wilfred Cantwell Smith wrote this book. I didn't learn anything from the book. It's, I knew Islam more than him, I believe, you know. But there was a footnote that was very important, very important, and opened my heart and mind. Why? Because Muslims deny the sonship of Jesus. And uh, even though uh, the Quran says he is a word from Allah and a spirit from him, but they explain it away. I'll tell you maybe later uh, what, how they explain it away. And the Holy Spirit is the Archangel Gabriel, okay? So how could uh, Jesus be the eternal Son of God, the eternal Word of God? And this a Canadian scholar had a note. He said, you cannot compare between Jesus and Muhammad. Most people go there. No, you can You can compare between Muhammad and King, da King David, maybe. Muhammad was a warrior and claimed to be a prophet, you know. Uh, but Jesus, as known in Christianity, is the word of God, the Logos. While the Quran, the book of Islam, is believed by Muslims to be the eternal word of Allah, letter and meaning. You can compare them together. And I thought, wow, the Mus Muslims fought in the Middle Ages about the creation of the Quran and the eternity of the Quran, killed each other. This was a very important issue for them. And the Orthodox Muslim, Muslims, mainly the mainstream Muslims, believe that the Quran is eternal. So Jesus, the word of God, is eternal? Yes, in the beginning was the word. And the, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And I understood the prologue of John, you know. Still, you know, it didn't really hit me much. And I thought, maybe I can really, you know, it's very difficult to leave your identity and your culture, and you try to wiggle around and find a, an explanation, what have you. And I thought, maybe I should leave no stone unturned, and uh, maybe... Uh, look for the truth in Eastern philosophy, in Hinduism, Buddhism. You, I, know, I mean, because if you're look, looking for the truth, you have to be objective. So I, uh, I tried to look for a Buddhist or Hindu temple. I couldn't find any in Beirut in 1981, uh, Beirut, Lebanon. And so I found a yoga course taught by a British lady at the American University of Beirut. I signed up for the yoga course and uh, uh, I walked into the classroom and the lady, the instructor, looked at me. Uh, Sir, did you come by mistake? Because all the students were ladies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, ma'am, I uh, signed up because I, need, I want to explore 
uh, how you see God in spiritual, uh, Eastern spirituality. She said, she said, wow, you came to the right place. Forget about Islam, forget about Christianity. We can do it through spiritual yoga. I said, okay, let's start. She said, no, you have to be vegetarian first. And you have to do physical yoga. So I was a guy doing three martial arts because I was full of hate. I want to kill my enemies with my bare hands if needed, you know. One Korean style, two Japanese styles, and used to jog five miles a day with my German shepherd. And I want to kill my enemies with my bare hands if needed, you know. And I had to, to accommodate yoga and, and get energy by munching on fruits and vegetables half of the day, you know, to get energy. I used to eat one, uh, one kilogram of peanuts, you know, and uh, spend the other half of the day in the bathroom because of the fibers, you know. <laughs> so, but I mean, these are real experiences, even though graphic, you know, but uh, in two months, she said, you are the most serious yoga student I had ever seen. You can start transcendental meditation. I was given a mantra, and the mantra is said to be like a uh, David Carradine's Om. It's not the same, but it depends on your height and weight, and psyche, they say. And I had to repeat that mantra that I didn't know what it meant for thousands of times, and it was like a tool, she said, it will dig in my soul, and then I rise up to God step by step. She didn't say God, uh, they say Samadhi, which is union, and yoga means union, union with the Creator. So, uh, the more I repeat that mantra, the more stupid I felt, actually. <laughs> the more I repeat that mantra, I, the more I knew, I realized that we may try to climb up to God with our spiritual exercise. We may try to climb up to God with our good works, but it's actually an upside down story. God came down to us in his word and the Praise word became Lord. flesh Amen. and Amen. tented among us, you know. And God opened my heart uh, to, uh, to confess Christ as Lord and Savior, you know. And uh, I... Uh, let me go on here. The word of God will never return empty even from the mouth of a secular professor, right? And uh, in uh, a long story short, in 2001, I, uh, I bumped into a retired Lutheran pastor from northern Minnesota. He came to Beirut to revive a mission society called Lutheran How Our Ministry, where it was destroyed. And uh, I was a professor, adjunct professor at the American University of Beirut teaching history and a full-time journalist. And I was coming back from a, uh, a trip to Switzerland where I hiked the Alps and, uh, and spoke in a conference of uh, uh, reconciliation and uh, peace initiatives and religious dialogue. And, uh, and uh, that, uh, pro uh, that pastor was in the elevator in Beirut, Lebanon. It was a huge elevator. In, he was trying to, to give his card to people and say, God is love in Arabic. He butchered the whole thing, actually. He didn't speak Arabic. <laughs> and Allah Mahabba in Arabic, he said, Habla, Habla, Habla. Habla means stupid in Arabic. I took the, the business card, smiled, and... Uh, uh, after half an hour, I called him. I was going, giving a course on Europe, and uh, I thought this Lutheran guy can, can speak about the, the Reformation better than me, a new face, a new, you know, that would, uh, the students would like it. So after, I helped him for three years. He, he was like a lone ranger looking for Tonto, and he found me. So we teamed up together, and uh, I, we went out in my free time to share the gospel with many people, uh, including the Bedouins on, t on the slopes of, the, of Mount Lebanon and the tents. And uh, after three years, he left Lebanon, and I was going to immigrate to Qatar to, Al to work in Al Jazeera when he called me. Hisham, why go to Qatar? Come to the United States. We'll find you a mission. I, I, I thought, you know, I went to Qatar. I didn't like it for three days, and I thought uh, I don't want to spend my, the rest of my life serving mammon, you know. Uh, I want to serve Jesus, you know, and uh, I used to have a uh, tourist visa and I used to come to the United States to speak in, in colleges from New York to California and other ch and churches as well, speak about terrorism, about Islam, because it's my graduate uh, studies in Islam. And uh, 
So I boarded a plane and never looked back. I arrived uh, to Michigan where it was very difficult. I didn't have a work permit. My uh, dinner was an, a bowl of oatmeal and milk, you know, and that was, you know, a very difficult, you know. And, uh, and uh, uh, there were, God sent two friends uh, who are uh, pastors and, uh, and they were doing what they call uh, Jerusalem Market. Bible, vacation Bible school, and uh, they thought I'll fit the role of the Arab, you know, so uh, <laughs> I, I went to Goodwill, got some baggy clothes, and put uh, something on my head, and I looked Arab, you know, and, uh, so uh, 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 the mission society that helped me come, you know, uh, or promised really a mission, a mission sent me to Concordia Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and before I graduated, they, uh, the, the, the economy collapsed in Michigan because of the recession and the, uh, its dependence on the auto industry. So they asked me to leave to Chicago. I didn't even have gas to get to Chicago, actually. Uh, long story short, I uh, made it and uh, I started to experience what you have in Chicago. And I thought, this is a mission impossible. Who could drive <laughs> on the, the road, you know? And uh, uh, in the day, you fight crazy drivers and sit in traffic, you know. I decided that uh, when I move out, I'm going to move at night. I took my, uh, I put my furniture in a U-Haul, put my car behind me, and set out from Ann Arbor, Michigan at 9 p.m. As soon as I hit 294, I discovered in the daytime, you fight crazy drivers, sit in traffic at night you fight truck drivers. <laughs> and they close all lanes for uh, uh, road works and keep one lane open. And it's a mission impossible, but with God, everything is possible, right? And uh, there was a Muslim woman. I was giving a food basket in Wheaton, Glen Allen, where a Muslim woman with a hijab, a veil, you know, a head scar, came and she said she wants two boxes instead of one box. She had five children. I told her, I'll give you three. And uh, then I called her, she didn't answer, called her and asked her then, uh, you know, my, my wife and I want to visit you. So we visited, had tea, and I asked her a question. She's a Muslim. Oh, was it? I mean, she passed away last week, actually. I asked her, uh, can I hold a Bible study in your apartment? And there was, you know, she was like a very sociable, a very kind of, uh, uh, you know, outgoing, and all the neighbors knew her, and she said, okay, you teach, I'll make lunch, okay? So, uh, so and uh, in that uh, summer, we baptized seven people, Iranians, Iraqis, etc., and uh, we, uh, you know, hospitality, we use hospitality, you know, we uh, invite them to to our homes, uh, we help them with furniture. You can see my dog uh, riding shotgun over there, <laughs> German Shepherd. She's still alive, she's 12 years old. And this is uh, my suburban that uh, went to the cemetery. Okay. <laughs> and uh, you see furniture, etc. we store it and clothing, give it away. And one night I gave out uh, 11 couches and the guy who was helping me, an American volunteer, said, oh, this is a couch kitchen. Everyone who comes gets a couch, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so we invite them to our celebrations. I was talking to Bob, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Uh, this is Thanksgiving, you know, and uh, you see a, a volunteer was playing the guitar. One man came to Thanksgiving dinner and he saw Jesus in dream twice and uh, et cetera, et cetera and uh, he was baptized later, what have you. So we boldly, you know, try to accommodate them, and uh, that's my wife, okay? <laughs> and she is like me, a convert from Islam, and uh, you can find my story on YouTube, etc. So we kind of uh, uh, share the gospel boldly, and uh, the word of God is mightier than a double-edged sword. You need a little bit of comparative studies in order to kind of... Uh, Today, uh, just today, I was at the mechanic and uh, a guy from Syria said, Salaamu Alaikum. I said, Wa Alaikum Salaam. And he said, uh, he thought I'm a Muslim, you know, because of the way I look. So, so, uh, so I uh, briefly told him my conversion story and he said, who would leave the greatest prophet in history and 
follow Jesus. I told him, I left the greatest, according to you, prophet ministry, and followed the word of God, eternal word of God, you know. Mm. Let's see. Jesus, uh, Muhammad died, Buddha died, uh, uh, Confucius died, but Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. So, so uh, uh, people, I mean, as I said, Muslims see Jesus in visions and dreams, and uh, I should stop here. Okay. I should stop here in order to take questions. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I